project is <laughs> is you know delighted to be here finally after working for um, almost two years collaborating with colleagues in in Concepcion um, and Villarrica, some dear friends of mine who are ethnoecologists, uh, ethno <coughs> and I have been working on these um, sort of a, a global comparative project on how people understand and relate to birds and use birds informationally about to learn about their environments. Um, and so particularly, um, this project, we're working in the wetlands of the uh, Rio Cruces in Concepcion, uh, sorry, in, in Valdivia, and really sort of, you know, in 15 minutes, I can convey three main concepts, I think. One is the importance of land tenure, all power play comes back to land. Um, all politics, I would even venture to say, comes back to who's in control of land and its resources. And so when we look at how people understand landscapes and use them and have access to resources, um, it always boils down in the end <coughs> to who's in control there. Memory is has become more of an anthropological um, topic recently, I'd say, especially in terms of understanding the history of landscapes and thinking about the ways in which people's knowledge and expertise and the ways in which they construct knowledge about landscapes really matter in the sense of um, they become materialized and they change people's lives. The way, the way we see landscapes and waterscapes actually changes the, the material realities that we live. Thirdly, one of the main focuses I'll be, I'll be experimenting with here is in methods. So in anthropology, we have a long history of extractive research in which people um, come to usually you know, a, a community that they're not a part of and ask to be resident there and to be students of knowledge, in my case, ecological knowledge. And we often work with experts and local indigenous scientists. And in the past, because of the way our publication systems work, and because of the way academia works, that is often you know, sort of translated into another language and removed and used in an international sphere in a way that then cuts off local people from commenting on, critiquing, and, and also using. Um, so there's a possibility now with, with electronic you know, connectivity and, and e-archives to start to turn that around and really make research much more transparent to the communities of, of knowledge origin. So we've been experimenting with a few, um, a few aspects of that. Sorry, this is so small. Um, the overall project has been going for two years already, and I've been participating remotely, but um, I'm <laughs> excited to actually get my feet wet, literally, in um, looking at the human dimensions of wetland conservation in Rio Cruces. So, Rio Cruces is um, an enormous wetland area and has is also the site of a lot of um, a lot of ecological change and national and even global perturbations like the 1960 uh, earthquake it was the biggest recorded earthquake in the world and its and its tsunamis you know, affected and is still alive in people's memories that changed the landscape and destroyed cities. Um, in particular, we're looking at, so we're doing, we've been doing interviews remotely because of COVID um, with seven different communities around the wetlands and asking them through maps and storytelling 
and what's your experience of change? What, what have you seen? What kind of ecological change have you seen across your lifetime? Um, mostly working with elders, but some youngsters as well, and then comparing with how people frame that change over their lifetime. Um, in particular, the cultural knowledge of birds that I over the last couple of years have become particularly interested in are actually indicator species. So um, very, very common when you ask bird experts in indigenous communities, and I, I've worked more extensively in Paraguay than in Chile, um, but there for sure, but, and I've seen it in every community I've asked, um, some of the first knowledge that is shared is birds as indicators of weather to come, some climate shifts, and particularly um, indicators of seasons. So there's a kind of, we start to see the importance of phenology and eco-calendars using the animal life and the plant life around us. And those eco-calendars are in many ways more accurate than a calendar that's created um, sort of on paper or through a bureaucratic social process because they are flexible and they're living. So as if there are perturbations or changes in climate, then the birds are often first indicators and actually give local people the cues to know, okay, when this bird appears, returns from its migrations, then we need to plant this kind of crop, or when um, when this bird is calling in a certain way, that means that this other animal or plant is either you know, nearby or it's ripe, or there's a, a multitude, you start to ask people about it, and it's one of the most common um, and socially shared, even children are, are well versed in these, these kinds of indicator species. Um, and then, of course, it's also linked to all kinds of um, cultural mnemonics like refranes um, populares or um, sayings and little ditties and poems and things like that. So that's something that's been collected and we'll probably, we'll probably be doing a comparative paper on that uh, soon. And then, in particular, also looking at, okay, well, how, um, you know, finding that local expertise is important. There are links to very real, detailed ecological knowledges. Um, how do we then translate that into local policy actions, national policy, global policy? We see that um, in the last 10 years, I'd say, but even even in the last two years, there's been a real acceleration in global policy recognition of the importance of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge in, in ecology. And one of, the, one of the things that indigenous scholars have been working on for decades and is finally getting traction is this idea, this recognition that indigenous stewardship of local landscapes and waterscapes has preserved biodiversity in ways that industrial landscape use has not. And so you see when you compare landscapes worldwide, you see that landscapes that have been protected um, either as reservations or just land tenure has remained in indigenous hands, um, those are also the reservoirs of biodiversity. And that's not an accident, it's actual has to do with the ways that people think about the land, interact with the land, and relate to all the other species. So what I'm really interested in is that, that dynamic, that, um, that give and take between ways of knowing the world and how philosophies of knowing the world and knowing relating to other beings in our world changes the material conditions in which we live. So this is the larger project that I've been involved in. It's called Biocultural Challenges. And um, working mainly in this Laboratorio de Estudios del Antropoceno, 
in the Universidad de Concepción. So we'll be, um, yeah, we're still figuring out what we'll be doing, actually. I mean, it's all just been a blur in terms of all the paperwork, but um, hopefully we will, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how does, I mean, what I would love to do is do seminars and uh, little teaching units. Uh, the University of Concepcion has this project out of the Centro, um, Centro de Intercultural and Indi uh, si yeah, Intercultural and Indigenous Studies, um, where they do two week workshops in the communities, either in schools or sort of elder ho housing or. Um, or ca other campuses, and I'm hoping to develop some kind of a, a hybrid workshop that look that in, involves um, looks at some of the scholarship that's being developed by indigenous scholars in in North America, and then comparing it with some of the indigenous scholarship here in Chile, and um, how this relates to what's going on in the constitution writing and, and Lisa Long Con's and uh, involvement there and you know so I'm I was really looking forward to understanding that dynamic a little a little better. This is the this is some of the wetlands around Valdivia and Rio Cruces. Um, as Alan mentioned, this is an area that's also suffered huge ecological disasters with factory spills and chemicals and in particular the um, the black neck swan has been one of the iconic species that's been talked about a lot in the in the media but then there's a whole flock of other birds that have been really affected over the years and so part of what our interviews are doing is um, we're just going to start doing the um, walkabout or floatabout, I guess you would say, interviews in which we go out with people on the wetlands in kayaks and ask them basically to tell stories about um, how, the, how the place has changed over their lifetime and how the, their interaction with birds. I think a lot of locals used to do more hunting and, um, and use birds more actively in their daily life. Whereas now it's it's sort of become a, more of a a species apart in a more of a Euro um, Euro American worldview, I would say, in, in that the, the the narrative is often about saving an iconic species, sort of as we are the dominant sort of species in control, and we will deign to save this bird species rather than. What is often found when you look from the ground up is it's not it's about maintaining a relationship between humans and these birds be, as beings that deserve respect. Often it's um, I'm not sure uh, here in Chile, but it, throughout Paraguay, the indigenous view is almost always um, among the seven communities I've worked with. Anyway, it's relationship with bird beings who used to be people, or could be people again. So it's a very person-to-person -person relationship. Um, and yeah, so we, so one of the things that, um, coming back to the, the methods aspect, another project I've been working on for the last seven years out of the University of Oxford is um, the Ethnoornithology World Atlas. So basically here what we're doing, and I, I started out as an ethnobotanist, so I'm more, I'll honestly, um, consider myself more of a general ethnoecologist than a bird expert, but we've been focusing, we've been starting with birds because birds are relatively politically neutral. There's a lot less issues around um, intellectual property, you know, when you get into medicinal plants and things like that. It, it can be it can get hairy quickly but what we're doing with the the ethnoornithology world atlas is basically an online portal to share digital stories oral histories and um, and 
and linguistic information, ecological information about, about birds. So each community that we work with can create an online um, section. For example, this is the, this is the IWA community for this project in Rio Cruces. And the idea is that as information is collected, either by video interviews or audio interviews or written, whatever it is, um, and photography, this, this can be uploaded to this community portal where immediately, if, the, if it's information that can be shared, immediately the people who shared it can also have access to it. And then they can go back on, they can log on and make comments and corrections. You know, to be perfectly honest, anthropologists get probably 85% of everything we write wrong. Um, <laughs> and that's generous, I think. And a, and a big part of that is because we just, we, we, you know, we try our best to get things right, but often we're working in a different language or, you know, a language even at to remove. Um, and then we don't have mechanisms, we don't nearly enough go back and check and sort of share everything in a totally transparent way and open ourselves to hard critique. Um, the critique comes anyway, so indigenous scholars are good at you know, calling us out, but they ha you know, are still, especially in South America, the, the funding for indigenous scholarship it hasn't, it's not there yet. So, um, and yeah, in general. for all scholarship, <laughs> but I'd say in particular, you know, I think Canada, Australia, U.S. right now are sort of seeing a renaissance in critique of anthropology. So this, that's good. Um, this system is is online. It's an online portal, which you know requires that people have some kind of internet access. So that's a, a, a real obstacle sometimes, um, but it can be used with smartphones as well. Um, the, the innovation of this, which is not our innovation, but rather has been designed by, by digital indigenous scholar, scholars in Canada, um, is that all of this information that is published can be protected at different levels. So it can be published for the world to see. Um, for example, if you've got a story about um, maybe the the spiritual importance of the black neck swan. Um, it could be published for everyone to see, or you can put limitations on and say, well, only people within my community can see this. And then at, when you log on, you, you become a member of different communities. And then also um, what people have found in ecological research throughout the world is that many communities have restrictions within the group as well, and so it might be that only elders are supposed to understand, uh, receive knowledge, or maybe it's only men or only women, or only um, you're only supposed to hear a story during the winter time or something like that. So this system has a way that you can put in cultural protocols as well, and those can be managed from the community itself. Um, so our hope is that you know. This will also be a mechanism for the repatriation of material that has already been published and removed from communities. Um, and you know, I would love to see sort of within the communities that I work, a lot of the genealogical information and old you know interviews that might have been recorded in the 70s or something like that. I know that people would love to hear their grandparents' stories, and they've been but they have no idea that they even exist, honestly, because they just know, oh, there was an anthropologist here in the 70s, but they don't have any, any access to that. So, um, yeah, hoping, we're really experimenting with this project in Chile to, to hope that we could kind of revolutionize in a bit in, um, the field and make it just de rigueur as linguists, linguists when they take recordings, they have to put it into a public archive. Um, why not anthropologists as well make everything available to posterity and to the local communities? So yeah, ask me in three months how that works. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks. I'll stop there.